So yeah, we'll get started in just a second. Whenever you're ready, sir, it's up to you. And I can right. actually put the videos on whenever you want. Um, okay. I've just got like a little cue in here sure, window sure. of the video. Sure. So welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Um, as I said before, we'll try not to get too technical. We'll just kind of keep things on like an introductory level so that we maintain interest and don't anesthetize everybody. Because um, I'd hate to bill for anesthetizing like 15 people or something. That's, that's a pretty good chunk of revenue. Um, so to start, anesthesia is the temporary loss of sensation or awareness that is induced for medical treatment. Um, sensation can be lost through the anesthetic gas that we place through a breathing tube um, or through an IV medication that puts your brain to sleep. Um, when we actually put your brain to sleep, um, we don't tell patients this, but you know, you're, you're actually going unconscious and it's a medically induced coma. So we can't tell, you know, cute little granny, we're about to put you in a medically induced coma. We'll take great care of you. Don't be scared because then they'll be scared. Um, so we can do that with, um, medication plus IV pain medication. Um, another way that we reduce or totally cause the patient to lose sensation is through a spinal injection um, in the cerebrospinal fluid right outside of your spinal canal. Um, that would numb you from you know, the lower chest or belly button all the way down to your toes. Um, or an epidural to block pain from labor or a C-section. Um, or a nerve block that blocks um, nerve impulses um, within a nerve to the arm, the leg, uh, chest, abdomen. Uh, for example, fixing a broken limb or reducing post-op pain for a day or two. Um, so also, that's how we knock out sensations. So how do we knock out awareness? Um, that would be a medication like uh, Versed. That's similar to Clonopin or Xanax. Um, so imagine a really uh, big trauma case that comes in, a gunshot wound with multiple stabbings. Uh, the patient's obviously lost blood in the field and they're continuing to lose blood in the ER until we you know, go in and uh, cauterize an artery or tie an artery off to reduce the blood loss. Uh, but the whole time they're losing blood, they're also uh, having an extremely low blood pressure. So we can't do what we would normally do with an anesthetic, which might be meds through the IV continuous or anesthetic gas, because that would drop their blood pressure too much. So in this case, we would actually just give them like a whiff of anesthetic gas plus um, some Versed or it's kind of like Klonopin or Xanax. So actually in that case, we're just causing the patient to not remember anything we're doing to them. Uh, we're, we're barely reducing their sensation. Um, so it's kind of an abstract concept. It's like if a tree falls in the middle of the woods and no one's around to witness it, did the tree really fall? You know, if you don't remember anything that, you know, a surgeon is doing to you to try to save your life, you know, what's the difference if you feel it or not? You, you don't remember it. So that's kind of anesthesia from different aspects, especially in a trauma case. Um, in the meantime, in that case, we're doing everything possible to bring the blood pressure back up. Um, so anesthesia is the temporary loss of sensation and the loss of awareness. Um, some history of anesthesia. In 2250 BC, the Babylonians uh, used henbane which was a uh, very primitive local anesthetic. Um, it's called hyoscamine. Uh, that was used to relieve a toothache and assist in tooth extraction. That was uh, 4,000 years ago, roughly. Uh, 400 BC, the Assyrians and Egyptians used carotid compression to induce temporary unconsciousness for cataract surgery or circumcision. That's a very crude way to do anesthesia. So they're causing their patient to pass out by pushing on their carotids. They pass out temporarily, then they do the surgery while they're passed out. Very archaic and primitive, but again, uh, the patient would uh, have a loss of sensation and a loss of awareness. Um, so they got a little bit more advanced in 64 BC. Um, Emperor Nero, he's the surgeon of the Roman Empire. Uh, he endorses mandrake, which is a local anesthetic, boiled in wine to induce insensibility. Uh, to those patients to be cut on or cauterized. So they basically drank wine mixed with mandrake, which is a very potent local anesthetic. Um, they would achieve almost a toxic dose in their blood 
which would render them ready to be cut on or uh, their tissue cauterized. In 1846 AD, so we're fast forwarding uh, almost 1800 years, um, ether was used by a dentist at um, Massachusetts General to anesthetize the first patient for tooth extraction. So this is the first time ether is used. Um, ether was our first anesthetic gas. Uh, it was very primitive. Um, the problem with ether was, even though it was profound for the day, it was very blood soluble. So when we say that word, that means it dissolves in blood very easily. Anytime a chemical dissolves in blood very easily, it means for us that it's slow, slow onset and slow elimination. So that means it took forever to put the patient to sleep and it took forever to wake them up. Um, as we got more advanced in our chemicals used in anesthesia, um, today we use what's called sevaflurane. It's a five carbon chain with a fluoride uh, atom attached. Um, it does not dissolve in blood um, much at all. So that means it's very fast on and fast off. So you can quickly get the gas on, go to sleep, quickly get the gas off, wake up. Uh, mid to late 1800s, nurse anesthetists were the first to practice um, anesthesia, uh, specifically in the Civil War from 1861 to 65. Um, 1884, um, cocaine was around, but it was established as the only naturally occurring local anesthetic or numbing medication. Um, it was actually used for the first time for a nerve block for surgery of the mandible or jaw. It's 1894, that's still a long time ago. Um, so crude beginnings as far as anesthesia, um, they first used ether to um, drop it onto a cloth placed on the patient's face from a glass bottle with a little micro dripper on it. So they measured how many drips per minute, placed that on the cloth. They figured out like drops per minute, how long does it take a patient to go to sleep? Uh, the patient's arms were raised in the air. Um, as they went off to sleep, their arm would slowly lower. Um, that was their sign of loss of consciousness. Um, plus a pinch test. They would pinch their, pinch their patients really hard. If they didn't respond to that, they were out. So all they had back then were uh, those very archaic signs plus uh, blood pressure and fill in the pulse. So how does anesthetic gas work? The sevoflurane we use today, is, that's our primary. We don't know fully, but it, we think it causes uh, disorder of structural proteins within the cell membrane of nerve cells, uh, causing a dulling of and a loss of impulses, both in the spinal cord and in the brain. We commonly combine sevoflurane with oxygen and nitrous oxide. Uh, nitrous is also another fast on, fast off gas which by itself has pain reducing properties and um, uh, amnesia, so it causes forgetfulness. Um, we primarily combine nitrous oxide with SIVO to lower the amount of SIVO needed. Um, so how do you know a patient is asleep? I mean, if you're just looking at them and you see the monitor, um, we know based on their vital signs, so their blood pressure, heart rate, breathing rate might lower. Um, the volume of breath they're breathing might lower. Um, we also know based on statistics, so we worked out the math to accurately state uh, the patient will most likely be awake at this gas concentration of SIBO, which is a percent, um, or we know statistically speaking that this gas concentration of SIBO will render like 95% of all patients asleep. Um, we have an anesthetic monitor, which we can probably get a video of that, which I don't have loaded. We can maybe find one of those later. Um, that just shows percent of sevoflurane breathing uh, breathed in and breathing out. So if I look at my monitor and I see uh, percent sevoflurane, the patient's breathing out, I think of that as the concentration of sevo in the brain. Um, so we have these. Uh, monitors and these statistics to tell us, you know, 95% of the time or 99% of the time, the patient uh, is asleep, uh, plus reliance on vital signs. I got a question on that. 
So sure. Is that the number one thing you look at, or what about the reflexes? A lot of things. Um, you kind of look at your monitors. You obviously, you know, look at your patient's individual response because not everyone responds uh, the same to the same dose. Um, as far as reflexes, uh, yeah, like um, sometimes I'll do a pinch test if I'm doing like a propofol uh, infusion for a colonoscopy. If uh, the patient doesn't respond to my little pinch, then more than likely they're not going to respond to uh, the colonoscopy. Um, we never like to pinch our patients, but uh, sometimes we'll do that just as an extra uh, establishment of um, anesthetic depth. They're not going to respond to the stimulus of surgery. Um, but as far as reflexes are concerned, um, like if you're tapping on the knee, uh, the uh, knee reflex everyone's aware of, uh, those reflexes uh, stay intact. Um, so we have other... Uh, IV anesthetic drugs we, we give also, which we know with 99% guarantee the patient will be asleep or not, depending on the dose. Um, so how is anesthetic gas delivered? It's delivered through a face mask that goes on your face. Um, it's connected to tubing that goes through our anesthesia machine. Um, a breathing tube that sits just past the vocal cords. Um, in the trachea, or what's called an LMA. This is a laryngeal mask airway. Um, this is a little bit quicker to place than a breathing tube, obviously. Um, but the LMA can be used for emergency airway management if placing a breathing tube is very difficult. Um, or you can also deliver your anesthetic gas through this and you know keep your patient safe under anesthesia. Um, did did they kind of do the same thing. Um, this has a little bulb right here you can inject air into. It'll make this cuff inflate to make the seal better. Um, this sits in a part of your neck called the hypopharynx. It's right above where your cords are, vocal cords are, where your trachea is. Um, if you're worried about someone coming in for surgery who ate, um, you know, let's say within like an eight hour time frame, um, this would not provide the best seal in the trachea. I would definitely use this because we would use this little bulb right here to um, inject air and this cuff would expand in the trachea providing a great seal. Um, one of the things we worry about in anesthesia is risk of aspiration. So that's stomach acid going into the lungs. Um, it's a very serious thing for us because you know patients are already sick with heart or lung disease. We do this to them. We put them behind the eight ball for potential death, um, loss of brain activity, um, longer hospital stay. Um, but in an emergency case, we'll place one of these quickly and the surgeon's already said, the surgery's an emergency, we need to proceed. We place one of these quickly, even if the patient might have a full stomach, this reduces their risk of aspiration to maybe 1%. Um, not an official number, but reduces their risk of aspiration drastically. So those are two ways we deliver the anesthetic gas. Um, we can also deliver the anesthetic gas through a tracheostomy, which you know sick patients with uh, uh, cancer in their larynx might have. Um, so we've got a video on actually intubating a patient. That's our first video. Um, all these videos are short, just so we can kind of move through the topics. But if you guys have any questions about what they're doing, uh, feel free to ask. So right here, this guy is breathing in uh, high flows of oxygen. Um, if you saturate all the tissues in the body with oxygen for like, um, let's say 10 big breaths, it buys us time to place an LMA or a breathing tube just in case their anatomy is terrible and they're a difficult intubation. Oh, so like they're not able to breathe while you're doing it? Right. Okay. Sometimes we will render them unconscious and keep their breathing very little so that if their airway is terrible, if their anatomy and their airway is terrible, we can um, rescue them from that, from that instance. So if we're thinking we have a difficult airway, um, we'll render the patient unconscious 
but keep them breathing so that we can augment their own breathing. They're checking the eyelid reflex right here. That's a way to tell if the patient's unconscious. Um, if you don't respond when someone's doing this to you by blinking, it's another way we assess that you're unconscious. So he's just making sure he can ventilate the patient. That just means he's squeezing that green bag behind him while he's creating a mask seal around the face and jaw. That's just to make sure he can breathe for the patient just in case placing the breathing tube is tough. He's using that oral airway to help open the airway. And so this is a Glidescope blade. This is a laryngoscope with a camera on it, so we'll see a screen with what he's seeing here pretty soon. That flap he's lifting is the epiglottis. Just kind of move it out of the way with the blade. It actually kind of falls out of the way on its own once you place the blade in the mouth. And so then he'll inflate that balloon right there. That's our anesthesia monitor there. So they've got heart rate and oxygen level. That's the blue number and blood pressure. So we see fogging in the tube. We see the chest rising up and down. And then we see um, before it cut out. Uh, Can't go. Do this. <laughs> Can't go. Do this. Is that the Squatty Potty ad? No. <laughs> <laughs> We're good on that one. Um, so the, the other confirmation we, we uh, check to make sure the tube is in the right place uh, in the trachea is uh, we want to see um, CO2 gas being blown off. Um, that's just an indicator that we're actually in the trachea and blowing off CO2 gas. So um, in the body, CO2 is um, an acid. Your body regulates uh, CO2 as sort of an acid-base balance. It's one of the aspects of our body that maintains homeostasis. Um, so we, we check to make sure CO2 is, is there. Um, types of anesthesia, uh, MAC stands for monitor, Monitored Anesthesia Care. The patient is not unconscious, but also not fully aware of surroundings or events. Uh, examples of this, we would use some IV Versed plus some numbing eye drops for a cataract surgery. Um, a big surgery where we would instill this mode of anesthesia is where they place, um, let's say a patient has Parkinson's, they have those fine motor tremors. Um, they can't get rid of the motor tremor with medication. So the next step, if their insurance covers it, is a deep brain stimulator. Um, so it's a, it's almost like a pacemaker placed in the motor cortex of the brain uh, that elicits stimulation and it sort of quiets those um, irregular impulses from uh, the, the motor cortex of the brain. Um, makes their tremors go away, hopefully. Um, so for this, they would uh, burr a hole through the skull. Uh, they would use um, neuromonitoring to make sure the brain is properly functioning while they're doing this, to make sure they're not damaging any delicate brain tissue. Um, and at a certain point in the case, they have to wake the patient up to ask them to move their arms and legs and talk, um, you know, give us a complete sentence, what year it is, to make sure no parts of the brain have been damaged, and also to test the stimulator's effectiveness. Um, so the patient can open their eyes and talk, but they're not aware of what's going on. That's an example of MAC anesthesia. Um, a general anesthetic is where the patient is all the way unconscious on anesthetic gas or IV medications uh, such as propofol. That's our primary IV med we use to put patients to sleep. It works on the um, sleep center of the brain. So if you inhibit uh, neuron impulses in the sleep center of the brain, it puts the whole brain to sleep. The brain's like, oh, okay, well, that ear's asleep. The whole brain's going to sleep. Uh, another type of anesthesia is uh, regional. That's a uh, nerve block 
that's placed with ultrasound and something called a nerve stimulator. Um, a nerve stimulator works like this. Um, your needle you're, you're placing through the tissue and placing close to the nerve uh, can elicit um, uh, electric current every so often, like every, every half second. Um, if this needle gets close to the nerve and is uh, giving off this electrical current, almost like a small shock, um, we'll see um, the hand clench or the foot move that lets us know we're very close to the nerve and we need to stop uh, stabbing the patient. We need to stop sticking the needle forward because we can risk um, damaging the nerves that we're actually just trying to block with a nerve block. You said the hand clench and what else did you check for? Um, depending on the nerve itself. So if it's a nerve block of like the arm, uh, we would check for a hand, twi hand twitch. Mm -hmm. If it's a nerve block of the, um, like the ankle or the front of the leg, we would check for a foot twitch. Those would be uh, confirmations that um, our needle is right outside the nerve where we want to be. Um, we would actually also confer the uh, needle placement with ultrasound too. So we've got a video of um, those that we'll pull up in just a second. Um, so we can block the nerves of the eye, shoulder, arm, hand, leg, knee, ankle, foot, abdomen, chest, or back. We don't have a great block for the clavicle just because of where it sits um, in your upper chest by your shoulders. Um, so don't break it. Don't fall and break your clavicle. So is that, that's only for like broken bones? It can, be for, it can be for broken bones or it can be for, um, let's say there's a tumor in and around a bone that needs to be removed because uh, we've sent it to cytology and we know it's cancerous. Mm -hmm. uh, we're removing it while it's non-metastatic. Um, that can hurt because you're um, taking out a tumor and you need clear margins, which means um, you need to establish with the lab that uh, there's no cancerous cells left in or around that tumor capsule. So a lot of times you have to take a lot of tissue and that hurts. So we place the nerve block to potentially help with post-op pain one to two days later. That's a good question. I was just thinking about after she said that, what if somebody has an upper cervical neck fracture? And how can you position the neck or head to actually intubate that? Um, so if they come in and they're in a C collar and they've been in a motorcycle wreck or something and um, we haven't sent them to like CT yet to uh, confirm that uh, spinal cord and um, surrounding structures are intact and not damaged. We'd place them in a C collar and we would most likely use the glide scope that you guys saw earlier um, because it's got that big curve on the blade itself that helps us to navigate uh, the larynx. Um, another way we'd intubate is called a fiber optic. Um, it's just a, it looks like a snake with a camera and a light on the end and you can go through the mouth or the nose and you have hand controls, which make the snake um, uh, fiber optic move around. And so you can move that around and hopefully get into the trachea and then pass a tube over the fiber optic uh, snake. Is that what you use most of the time now? Because when I was in my anesthesia, I remember a Miller and a Macintosh. And that was it. Yeah. I remember saying that like 30 years ago. But. Yeah, most of the time, um, CRNAs or anesthesiologists, uh, we use a Mac or a Miller. Um, if we think the patient's airway is uh, easy, if we think it's difficult, um, we'll use the glide scope, that's the video laryngoscope. Um, or if it's looking next to impossible, we'll actually do something where we keep them awake and we can do a nerve block of the trachea where we pierce through, this is called the cricothyroid membrane, it's right underneath your Adam's apple. Uh, we can pierce that with a needle and then inject some numbing medication. Um, we can also get the patient to um, breathe in some uh, lidocaine that will numb their throat. Um, we can also get, well, we would also numb their throat with some lidocaine uh, jelly and then place that fiber optic uh, down either through their nose or their mouth and look for their trachea that way. So, so it really varies for each patient. Yeah. Like, you have to know like everything that's going on with the patient. Yep, sometimes you don't. Um, sometimes a patient comes into the ER and you don't know anything. Um, you know, luckily with 
you know, 2023, we have electronic medical records. Right. So if a patient has been into the ER before, let's say a homeless person, um, you know, they might not have health insurance, but we still create medical records for them. You know, we still know, hey, this homeless person has like cancer of the larynx, they're a tough airway, they were in a car wreck, we would most likely use the fiber optic um, like camera. Yeah. yeah. Um, Do you find that the cetrocaine spray is mostly used? The what? The cetrocaine spray. Cetrocaine spray. Um, I haven't used that a lot, honestly. Um, we we primarily use lidocaine. Um, my guess is that lidocaine has less um, toxicity than uh, cet cetacaine. Okay. Um, I think cetacaine spray, if used too often, can just cause some toxicity in the blood that interferes with um, oxygen getting into the tissues um, versus lidocaine. Has, it's a... Uh, numbing medication. It's been around for decades. Um, we can do the nerve block through the trachea. We can get the patient to breathe in like a lidocaine spray. We can squirt a lidocaine down their throat. We can make a lidocaine lollipop so that when we place this fiber optic uh, snake looking tube in, you know, they're not coughing and not just altogether miserable. Most of the time they're pretty numb to it. Um, yeah, no problem. How long can someone stay under anesthesia for? Like, and um, and still be and still wake up um, healthy. I would say the max is probably eight to twelve hours. Um, like cause like health conditions if they're under longer. I would say no. Um, so, one of the difficulties in establishing the answer to your question is uh, creating a study that would answer this question. And it's difficult to create a high quality study where you know some harm to patients might happen. Um, but that same high quality study is just the thing we need to answer that question. Um, sometimes it's difficult to prove cause and effect from let's say the cause is anesthesia being delivered too long and the effect is um, short term memory loss uh, forgetfulness or you know mom or grandma is just not the same af after anesthesia um, so because of that really all we can go by is um, what's called retroactive data or data on cases that have already happened okay. that's not considered a high quality uh, form of data um, but it is something that we have um, so what we know uh, in 2023 is patients with um, uh, dementia um, traumatic brain injury, um, Alzheimer's, they're at a higher risk of having some short-term cognitive effects after anesthesia. Um, and in those patients, we, we actually wouldn't use the anesthetic gas, we would just use the IV medication that I spoke of. Um, because in Alzheimer's, there's disruptions in proteins within the brain. Um, and so in those patients, we think that the anesthetic gas could um, further disrupt those already uh, damaged proteins. So hopefully that, does that help answer your question? It does. Okay. Is that IV stuff, I mean, I've seen a video, it almost looks like a milky. Yeah. Is that what that is? Yeah. That's one of the primary uh, drugs we give. It's called Purpofol. Um, it's the same stuff that, same stuff that killed Michael Jackson. Um, is that, is that yeah. what that is? The, actually, the reason why he died, um, without remembering like all the, the facts, um, was that his his doc was either a cardiologist or just a primary care provider. He wasn't trained in critical care medicine or anesthesia. He actually placed uh, Mike under a propofol drip like every night uh, with very crude uh, monitoring at home. And if you're placed on propofol for too long, you can have liver damage. So like in the ICU, we would use propofol to keep patients asleep who were also intubated. Uh, but after like, I think 24 or 48 hours, we would measure their liver enzymes through their blood um, to make sure they're not having liver damage. If we saw those liver enzymes go up, then we would just cut the propofol off and use something else. Um, but he died because um, he didn't have our advanced monitoring we use uh, today in anesthesia to make sure that the patients uh, not obstructing in their airway, um, still breathing properly, still getting oxygen to their brain. Wow. So he was collecting a pretty hefty fee, I'm sure, from from Michael Jackson for doing this. So you know, greed sometimes trumps 
safety. Um, any other questions right now? Uh, what do you do if you have a patient, you know, mid, you know, abdomen's open, doctor's still going at it, mm -hmm. and codes out? What do you do? They start coding? Yeah. Open abdomen. Hope I never, I hope know. I never see that. Um, they would start chest compressions. Um, they could still push on the heart. <clears throat> if the chest is open, the surgeon can just squeeze on the heart. That's right. actually like a very effective way to chest compress. Um, but okay. you. But would you, I mean, what do you, what do you, what's your role? I mean, what would you end up doing then? Um, my role would be to um, call a code, you know, call for help, um, call for the crash cart. That's a special cart with uh, extra medications in it. Um, the most likely cause would be uh, extreme blood loss, um, maybe some abnormal electrolyte that's causing their heart to go into a lethal heart rhythm, uh, like VTAC or VFib. Um, some hospitals have a little computerized lab device where you can draw some blood from the patient, put that, um, it's called an iStat. I don't know if you guys talk about iStats, um, but it's a computerized lab module that looks like a giant 1980 cell phone. And you can put a drop of blood into it and it'll give you all these lab values. Um, it's not as reliable as sending a vial of blood down to the blood bank or blood, uh, blood lab, but it is something. So a lot of times we'll do that just for a quick assessment of like, you know, is there potassium low? Um, is there a hemoglobin hematocrit low? Um, we'd immediately start uh, CPR, getting blood into them. Um, a lot of times we'll go by what their heart rhythm uh, looks like on the screen. Um, so if they're in VTAC or VFib, first thing I would check would probably be potassium or uh, magnesium. Sometimes those are just chronically low in patients. Um, so we'd start giving blood products. Uh, the surgeon, the scrub tech would uh, start CPR. Um, we might place an extra big IV in their neck or in their upper chest uh, just to get uh, blood volume in as quick as we can. So are you keeping the anesthesia like the same? Like During that, um, we would turn it off and we would actually um, initiate what we talked about, which is MAC mm -hmm. anesthesia. So at that point, we're only worried about uh, the patient recalling or remembering this event. And so I would give them some Versed uh, right in the middle of this code so that um, they they don't remember all these things that are happening to them. Um, and usually when, when you're having a code, uh, your body kind of goes into a protective mode. Um, so brain impulse is slow. Um, you know, you, there's, there's very little chance you would remember this anyway, but we would give some Versed just on top of it just to make sure you don't remember it. But there would be no anesthetic on board in, in that case. It would just be um, making sure the patient doesn't remember anything. So, haven't seen that yet, hope I, hope I don't. Um, the only time I've ever seen a code is when we were doing a shoulder surgery. I've seen a few codes, but um, a code you didn't expect to happen was during a shoulder surgery. Um, patients are sitting up for shoulder surgery. Um, if, if someone has uh, clogged carotid arteries that we don't know about, um, their brain depends on I would say a higher blood pressure than normal to perfuse the brain. Um, when you sit them up, if we're not careful, we can overdose the patient with anesthetics um, so that their blood pressure drops too low, then they have a stroke, then potentially see VTAC or VFib. Have so, you seen nope, haven't seen that yet. Um, we've seen, um, there's several conditions that mimic malignant hyperthermia. Um, these are kind of technical, I can go into them if you want, but uh, there's several conditions that um, mimic malignant hyperthermia. Um, the biggest way you would rule out these other conditions would be um, the patient is very stiff um, due to uh, the nature of malignant hyperthermia and their temperature and uh, CO2 are going up drastically. Um, those are normally the things we use to rule out those other conditions. Can you be allergic? some of the thing, like anesthesia, is that possible? You can, um, you can be allergic to the gas, you can be allergic to succinylcholine, um, that's our primary uh, paralytical use when we place one of these breathing tubes. Um, the reason why we use a paralytic to begin with is because if we did it, um, we go down and see the view like they did with the, laryngos the laryngoscope, the cords were open, 
that's because they used a paralytic agent. Um, if we didn't, the cords would stay together and we'd force the breathing tube through and damage the cords. Um, so you can be allergic to the paralytic, uh, which is sucks, or you can be allergic to the anesthetic gas. Um, I think the incidence of that is like one in, I have to look at my phone, I think it's like one in a hundred thousand or one so in, it's really rare. yeah, it's really rare. Have you ever seen any cases like that where they came in and they didn't know? Um, I have seen a patient that wasn't allergic to um, um, sucks or the gas in a malignant hyperthermia way, um, but their um, their enzymes that are used to metabolize the sucks were deficient and we didn't know about it. So we gave them sucks and then they were paralyzed for like five hours afterwards. Um, oh, okay. And we didn't know about it. But then once this happened, we tested their blood and um, they were deficient in this enzyme that's used to metabolize sucks. Are you able to reverse it? You can't reverse it. So the only thing you can do is start the MAC anesthesia or start some sort of IV sedation so their brain's asleep and you're you're testing them every couple hours to see if they're uh, fighting the breathing tube being down. Um, we can reverse other paralytics, but not sucks. But I'd say in 99% of cases, your body metabolizes sucks on its own without any without any problems. Hmm. Good questions. Um, so if you guys want to watch the video on the regional nerve block, that's the nerve block of the upper extremity. Uh, go to the brachial plexus block. I was hoping there'd be some awkward ads on these videos, but <laughs> there haven't been so far. Just to backtrack on that, I just did a heard Now, sucks is obviously a trigger for living in hypothermia, right? Mm -hmm. And the reversal is dangerous. That's not reversed in sucks at any time? That's not reversing sucks. What is dantrolene actually? Dantrolene is blocking um, calcium channels from releasing calcium. Um, so you guys have heard of calcium channel blockers um, that are blood pressure medication, um, like uh, amlodipine or Norvasc. It's a common uh, blood pressure medication. That's a calcium channel blocker. Um, that's used to block calcium channels in your arteries and veins, but dantrolene is used to block calcium channels from opening and closing in your muscles. Um, so in MH, the problem is that your muscles are releasing uh, massive quantities of calcium, and that same calcium is initiating a, a massive muscle contraction. So when they say reverse, it's not reversing, it's just blocking. Yeah, but it, you know, it will reverse the symptoms of the MH um, just not, it's not actually reversing the sucks, just, just the image. You can turn on the audio if you want. No, I apologize. That's all right. You, you, the patient here is positioned supine with the head turned opposite from the block site. Scanning begins with the transducer oriented transverse on the neck and superior to the clavicle at the midpoint. This view, you may recognize, is similar to the scan for the supraclavicular block. The probe is slowly translated cephalad to identify the anterior and middle scalene muscles with the brachial plexus located in between. So those are the nerves of the neck, but those nerves actually form also the nerves of your arm and hand. So the right sternocleidomastoid muscle and prevertebral fascia are visualized superficial to the brachial plexus. The nerve roots of the brachial plexus are visualized between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. Here we see the C5 nerve root, a split C6 nerve root, and a split C7 nerve root. The structures are commonly described as a traffic light sign within the interscalene groove. The phrenic nerve is located anteriorly to the anterior scalene muscle. The vertebral artery can also be identified. The neck is highly vascular and colored Doppler imaging is often helpful to avoid vessels. The needle tip should be directed from lateral to medial in between the nerve roots to avoid accidental nerve root injury. A subtle pop is elicited as the needle passes through the prevertebral fascia.
So you pause it for a second. Um, so then once we fill that pop and we see this needle uh, coming in on ultrasound, um, we would aspirate to make sure that there's not like a vein around because we don't want to give our numbing medication into a vein. Um, and then we would inject the local anesthetic here and we'll see it spread around and surround um, these uh, nerve roots here. Um, once we see the local anesthetic surrounding here, we know the patient's got a great nerve block um, and then we're done. Um, we can also use that nerve stimulator I was talking about, which is attached to the needle. So I would guess once you get, I mean, once you get really close to these uh, structures here, that's when you start seeing the hand twitch. So that's how you know, hey, not only am I getting close on ultrasound, but my nerve stimulator is telling me, you know, stop right there because you're, you're right in front of the nerve. Is that just from like pushing on the nerve that it does that? The nerve stimulator like itself? Why, they, why it twitches? Um, because the electric current is operating the same way our nervous system works. Um, and so you have motor nerves, sensory and motor nerves that run through here. So once you apply the electric current to the motor nerve, it, in, it instantly initiates a contraction, a muscle contraction. Um, so we place these every day, like for shoulder surgery. Um, what about like elbow surgery? Yeah, elbow surgery, uh, surgery of the wrist. Um, Distal radius. This is ultrasound. Um, so this is our ultrasound probe here. Um, it works via sound waves. Um, and there's a computer off to the side that this is connected to that analyzes the sound waves and translates those sound waves into an image. So that's, that's how we know like what it looks like and where we are. Um, it's pretty neat though. We have a lot of cool toys. That's what I'm trying to uh, bring up today is, you know, jobs are fun, but jobs are more fun when you have cool toys. <laughs> um, so those are some things about regional anesthesia. Uh, we talked a little bit about spinals and epidurals. Um, a spinal injection is an injection of a local anesthetic or numbing medication. Um, actually into the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, this fluid is what your spinal cord and brain actually float in, uh, which I think is pretty cool. Um, the second, which is an epidural, is an injection of medication like two layers outside of this cerebral spinal fluid. Both these treatments prevent pain signals from getting to the spinal cord and therefore they're not perceived by the brain. Um, a spinal injection could be for a total hip surgery, a knee surgery. Um, you guys go over TERPS or transurethral resection of the prostate. Um, we would do a spinal for like a super old person, uh, elderly person, um, or a C-section. Are they unconscious during spinal injection? Um, no, this depends on the patient. So if they're super anxious, we'll give them a little bit of something like Versed uh, just to sort of relax them. Um, but the problem with doing that is successful placement of the spinal or epidural depends on the patient getting into the right position uh, to open up their lumbar space for us because that's where our injection goes primarily. And if they can't maintain that position because we knocked them out, then um, it's tougher to place. Um, also, just to keep the wires off our back, it's best to place these while the patient is uh, awake or sedated. That way they can tell you if, you know, your needle's getting too close to their actual spinal cord. And so we have that happen sometimes. Um, you know, a patient will just kind of go, ow, like really quick and jerk their body. We know that we're really close to the spinal cord and we have to pull our needle back a little bit. Um, but the risk of actually hurting their spinal cord is low because you're supposed to advance your needle super slow. So you think about stabbing yourself. It's going to happen when you're versus, you know, cutting onions or something really slow. Can you use like an x-ray to show, ex like, to view it while you do it or? Um, you can, you can use x-ray. Uh, primarily physicians use an x-ray for like an epidural injection uh, for chronic back pain um, but for this we're just using uh, we're using um, something called a loss of resistance so that we know we're in the right spot um, when we 
enter that cerebrospinal fluid space, that's called the subarachnoid space. It's a negative pressure space within the uh, vertebral column. So like you're advancing your needle, you feel pressure, 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 and then all of a sudden your needle kind of gets sucked in a little bit. That's one indicator that you're in the proper spot. So that happens uh, a lot with an epidural placement. Um, side effects from this can be numbness, which we want. Um, you know, if you're a mom and you're having contractions, you don't feel your contractions anymore and you instantly love anesthesia and you're so glad you have, you had an epidural and now we're your best friend, whereas before you want to smack us upside the head. Um, numbness, heaviness in your legs, uh, tingling, uh, warmth, you know, from the chest or waist down on the toes. Um, also, you feel like you don't know where your limbs are in space, which that's very common. That's a loss of proprioception. Um, a lot of people, you know, they, they freak out in like a positive way. They can't believe that, you know, they don't know where their legs are in space after a spinal or epidural, but it's supposed to be like that. Uh, so we've got a video on spinal injections up there. How long does that last? It depends on the medication. Um, so I work at a, a Murdoch, which is an outpatient surgery center. We do total hips and knees there. And so we'll place a spinal for most of their total hips and knees. Um, we want them to um, start moving again and walking uh, quickly after surgery. So we would use something super uh, short acting like lidocaine, mm -hmm. um, but we can make it last up to like four or six hours if we want, depending on the medication. You can't mix, you can mix lidocaine with bupivacaine, but only for a uh, peripheral nerve block. Okay. I wouldn't mix it for a spinal. Um, just because in some, in some instances, if you mix local anesthetics, you, you get the opposite of what you want. So you can get long onset and short duration, mm -hmm. which is kind of what you don't want. You either want short onset, short duration, or long onset, long duration. So this is somebody placing the spinal, hopefully. It's kind of a short video, so I hope this is the one I want. And so he's scrubbing the back with um, bovidone or uh, I think it's iodine mixed with alcohol. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Right yeah. Now? On that one view here, I've asked, you know, Brian, and I've always tried to get it. Where, are you, where is the sweet spot? Are you looking at L2, L3? Is that kind of a guide for you? And what's, the, he said something about a horse's tail. Is that that where you're trying to look for it to branch down on a spider? Um, so normally... Normally we want to go L3, L4 because the spinal cord ends at um, L1, L2 or L2, L3. So if we go below where we know statistically the actual spinal cord ends, if the patient jumps or if we go forward with our needle too far, we're not actually injuring spinal cord because it's a few vertebrae higher than where we're going. Um, but sometimes the sweet spot can vary on a patient, like patients who are morbidly obese with um, uh, trunk fat distribution, um, you can feel the vertebrae much better going up, you know, a couple of levels on their back. Um, so that, that would actually be where the spinal cord is, but you're just, you're always super careful with, um, with what you do. And so right now he's numbing up the skin of the back and now he's got his needle in the cerebral spinal fluid. And so if you, so if you back, watching they pull that needle out initially and they're watching for fluid to come back correct? yes or yep. as soon as you feel a pop or a click with your needle you would aspirate your needle and you'll see uh, cerebral spinal fluid come into your needle it's a swirl okay. um, so we see a nice swirl that's how we know our needles uh, within what's called the subarachnoid space then we give the medication wipe off the back sit them down real quick they start getting numb usually within 30 seconds or a minute after we place it um, it is a crazy feeling. Yeah. That. <laughs> so someone said it, it's very sweet. The question is, how do they know? Is that going in? <laughs> <laughs> I guess really? as far as far sugar based, is that? What uh, it could be. I mean, it's got um, dextrose in it. Um, it's got dextrose in it to make it sink. Um, so that could be why. But uh, keep going a little bit. It went to the end. Oh, okay. I know it's kind of hard to like pinpoint. Pressure. 
That was be good the, like, the, the quickest oh, final I've ever seen in my life. Maybe go to like the middle. I think this one's epidural. Uh, it's okay, we can keep going. With so he's numbing up the back, and what he's doing right here, just pause it, is he's using his numbing needle to see if there's vertebrae in his way. Um, so if he can stick his numbing needle like all the way in, you're still staying outside the spinal column. But if he can stick his numbing, his numbing needle all the way in, that's telling him, okay, um, this is the correct path for my, my next needle, which is gonna end up in the um, subarachnoid space. It's kind of used as like a finder needle. And then pause it right here. So he probably felt a little click or a pop with his needle. And now he takes this out and now the cerebral spinal fluid will start dropping out here, which I never do because, you know, you can, a person can get a headache if too much of that fluid comes out too fast. So usually you would just aspirate with your needle and see the CSF in your needle and then inject your medication and then you're done. Do people tend to itch from that when they're coming out, out, out of it after the epidural after it starts wearing off? Um, they can if you mix too much narcotic with your numbing medication, which, um... I felt like my skin was going to roll off, it was like, it was itching so bad. <laughs> we try to not mix uh, very much narcotic at all, because um, it makes people miserable, but at the same time that narcotic helps to reduce the pain from contractions and progressing labor. Best thing ever. <laughs> yep. Uh, I didn't have a door, I yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. The placement of the lumbar epidural catheter is performed to facilitate the induction of anesthesia and analgesia. So what this he's doing, just pause it right here. Relevant anatomy and placement. So this is the big needle they use to actually um, place the epidural catheter. As he's going forward with it, he's going super slow. And he has a syringe attached to this needle with um, air or saline in it. It's called a glass syringe. And you guys seen syringes before? Okay. Um, so it's a syringe that moves very freely within itself. It's like a low, a low friction syringe. Are they numb at all when inserting that first, like? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, they've, they've had lots of numbing medication like in their, um, their top layers of skin. Um, but the way they know they're in the right spot is, it's, while they're uh, advancing that needle, they're pushing on that uh, glass syringe, which has saline in it. As soon as they get into the epidural space, um, that syringe and all the saline in it just kind of goes whoosh, it goes forward. It's a negative pressure space. So that lets them know they're in the right spot. Placement then they thread their catheter. catheter. Placement of a catheter in the lumbar epidural space allows one to administer analgesic and local anesthetic agents to assist with is very important for this procedure. Don a mask, head covering, and sterile gloves. Fast forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. Adhere to the polypotents so that you can apply the antiseptic skin cleanser in a back and forth motion for approximately 30 seconds. Allow the solution to air dry for at least 30 seconds. Place the sterile drape over the patient's back so that the opening provides access to the planned site of catheter placement. The epidural catheter should be placed at a level that will provide anesthesia or analgesia for the particular procedure or for control of labor pain. Oh Use the infiltration and finder needle to infiltrate the skin and superficial tissue with 1% or 2% lidocaine to maximize patient comfort. So you there's your use numbing this medication to before. identify the approximate depth of ligaments and bone. With the stylet in place, Insert the epidural needle through the same entry point that you used with the finder needle. The purpose of the stylet is to prevent the tip of the epidural needle from becoming obstructed by patient tissue. One technique involves holding the epidural needle with the bevel facing up, using both hands, with the thumbs and index fingers holding each side of the hub. Advance the needle to pass through the supraspinous ligament and into the interspinous ligament which in most patients is at a depth of approximately two to four centimeters. 
it starts feeling like you're going Next, through an eraser the stylet from of the a pencil. Needle and attach the loss of resistance syringe, which should contain no more than two to three milliliters of either air or saline. So that's that glass Before syringe. Before you advance the needle further, make sure that resistance is present by gently tapping the plunger. Uh, stupid question, why is that for glass? Because it's, um, it's a low friction syringe. Okay. So if it's glass, then the syringe and the um, plunger inside are moving. Uh, it's moving within itself very freely. If it used a regular syringe, we wouldn't have that uh, feedback of the plunger going forward and knowing that we're in the epidural space. Or the syringe. The plunger should not advance. Next, slowly advance the epidural needle in small increments of two to three millimeters at a time. After each advancement, Check for the presence or absence of resistance by gently tapping the plunger with one hand. So you keep pushing sure on your plunger, the epidural needle stable and it's not moving hand. because you're not in the epidural space you yet. You will know you have entered the epidural space when there is loss of resistance, as indicated by a smooth collapse of the plunger into the syringe. Once you feel this loss of resistance, the epidural catheter can be placed. First, refer to the markings on the needle to note the depth at which the needle has entered the epidural space. For example, if you insert a 9 cm epidural needle and 4 cm of the needle remains outside the patient's skin, the distance from the skin to the epidural space is 5 cm. Note that longer epidural needles are available for use in obese patients. Epidural needle over the catheter, being careful not to dislodge the catheter. Then slowly withdraw the catheter, leaving 3 to 5 cm of the catheter in the epidural space. For example, if the loss of resistance occurs at 5 centimeters, the catheter should be taped at the markings between 8 and... Now, this is typically for what, like OB times? Yeah, OB. That's where we place most of our uh, epidurals. Um, you can do them still for like thoracic surgery, but we're starting to do more um, nerve blocks for that instead of the epidural, because with the epidural, um, you can't walk with it being placed. You can start an epidural and just give narcotic through it. So the patient has relief of pain from like labor contractions um, and they can still walk around. And then when their contractions start getting like, you know, really uh, severe, then we can make them bedridden and then start giving them numbing medication, which will make them uh, unable to walk. Um, so if a few other things we do in our uh, profession, we place uh, central lines. This is a big bore uh, IV that's placed uh, in the IJ, internal jugular in the neck, or the subclavian vein, which is uh, right below your clavicle. Um, these are placed for super sick patients, a big surgery with um, lots of anticipated blood loss, um, an emergency case, or a patient with poor IV access. Um, or if you're doing a lot of trauma, like at a uh, Gulf Coast down in Fort Myers, um, they have a lot of patients that come in, well, many patients that come in with uh, multiple fractures all over their body. So like arm and lead fractures. If you had someone like that, you know, you're gonna be really nice if you just give them a IV in their neck so that they can have surgery on their limbs and not have to worry about an IV being there too. So we've got a video on placement of a central line here. Should have some audio. A linear array transducer with a venous exam type is used to perform an ultrasound guided insertion of an internal jugular catheter via a transverse approach. The patient is in a supine position with the head slightly turned toward the contralateral side. The operator is positioned at the head of the bed. The transducer is placed transversely just below the apex of the sternocleidomastoid muscle triangle with the orientation marker directed to the patient's left at a nine o'clock position. The most superficial structure identified in the ultrasound image is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Deeper to this, the internal jugular vein will appear as a dark anechoic elliptical shape and is compressible with transducer pressure. So pause it right there. The artery will be... So one of the reasons why we use ultrasound to do this is because the carotid artery and the internal jugular a lot of times are right on top of each other. Um, so we can accidentally place our central line in the carotid artery instead of the jugular vein where we want. And if no one catches this, we can give the patient medication through the IV 
it goes right to their brain if they have seizures or they go unconscious or they have brain damage. So we don't want that. Circular and pulsatile. The thyroid gland lies medial to these structures and has a light gray echo signature. Adjust the transducer so it is centered over the internal jugular vein. Follow the needle entry by slowly sliding the transducer in the direction of needle advancement. The needle will appear as a small, bright, hyperechoic dot. When the needle tip appears, the transducer should be advanced a short distance distally to follow the tip of the needle trajectory and stay in advance of the needle entry. The needle is slowly advanced under direct ultrasound visualization until the tip is seen to indent and then puncture the internal jugular vein. There you go. The transducer should be moved slightly proximally and distally to confirm that the needle tip lies in the mid portion of the jugular vein. So from here you would um, just place your catheter uh, over the needle and the ultrasound just helps make sure you're, you're in the right spot for that. Um, so one of the last uh, neat things we do is called one lung ventilation. So this is a special breathing tube you place that allows you to clamp one side of the tube and collapse one lung by letting all the air out of the, um, the lung and pressure. Uh, and operate on it while you're still breathing for the patient with the other lung. Um, so this will be done for uh, lung cancer, um, a mass, patients with like a recurring uh, pneumothorax, which is like recurrent collapsing of the lung. Um, Hi everyone. So this is like how to place one of those tubes. So I've been lucky enough to work with Veriblon, uh, makers of Glidescope, and the Eflex single-use Glidescope. And so we're going to go ahead and show you how to place one of these 35 French double moon tubes and check its position. So, what's this one? So we have a workstation here. I have two syringes, one for the tracheal, one for the longeal cup. We have our adapter. This will get attached to our camping bag or to our ventilator that we use. And it goes to the product Hey Matt, could you read what does this say on the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> is it that? <laughs> what language is that? I have no idea. Dutch or German. I didn't know it had this when I watched it the first time. I thought I was having a stroke there. I'm going to go ahead and take my blade with my left hand. Right, that is certainly not the same. Now, you can see our molecula right in this space here. The tip of the blade is in that space. Our glottis is right here. And we're going to go ahead and open up the vocal cords right there. Now, the tube, you see how the tip points up? We're going to go ahead and put it in, pointing upwards. And you'll see why, because shortly after we're going to dive in. just in time. We need to have someone to intubate on. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Never been there. Now, now, see, we have passed. The, the important part here is going to be to remove the rigid stylet before we go any further. You can see here that our blue bronchial cuff has passed through the vocal cords and our tracheal cuff is here. This is our epiglottis and our molecular space where the end of the stroke is sitting. Now we're going to go ahead and remove our rigid stylet. The reason is that this goes through the trachea and can really cause a lot of damage. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pull it out and it's going to go towards the feet. We're going to make sure we saw that nice view. And we're going to go ahead and rotate. So the tube's through the vocal cords now. As we he's, been a, he's been a lot more traumatic with it than I would be. The left is that we need to make sure that that left side tube goes down to the left main stem on this. Okay? So once our tube's in, we're going to go ahead, we're going to inflate our tracheal cuff because that's going to allow us to ventilate to both lungs. And we're going to attach our adapter here. And like I mentioned before, this is going to go ahead and plug into our ventilator or anything. We're going to go ahead and grab our Glidescope B-Flex 3.8 single-use bronchoscope. And we're going to open it up. And this is what we're going to use to check our tube placement. OK? So this just pops off, pops on here magnetically, which is actually really nice. You can see. The feature of our picture-in-picture, picture, uh, our 
lights are up here on A, and our uh, bronc here on B. So now we're going to go ahead and grab our B-flex 3.8 bronc scope. This is the only one you can use down the double lumen in your tracheal tubes. And I'm going to hang it here on the workstation because I now don't need an extra pair of hands. So we're going to go ahead and feed our bronchoscope right through our bronchial lead. And I'm going to go ahead and pop this off now so I can make sure I can get it all the way in. And I have my camera adjustment here. I'm going to go all the way down. And the goal is we need to see the coin. And boom, there it is. So that's where the trachea splits into left and right, left and right lung. So he's advancing the tube right here, just so it goes in the left, left bronchus. All right, so you can end it there if you want. So kind of a lengthy video, but uh, just kind of shows you how you place one of those double lumen tubes, um, so you can collapse one lung and breathe with the other lung. Um, so just a little bit about medications, um, narcotics. Um, narcotics have been used since 4000 BC. Uh, they found some Sumerian artifacts that depict poppy or opium usage. Um, uh, opium is a painkiller. Um, all our opioids uh, primarily consist of fentanyl, dilated, and morphine. Uh, they all drop uh, the quality of breathing, uh, respiratory rate, cause dry mouth, low heart rate, and most importantly block pain in the spinal cord and the brain. Um, ketamine is another one. Um, ketamine causes uh, cardiac stability so it doesn't drop any function uh, of the heart or heart pumping. It also doesn't uh, cause a drop in breathing quality. Um, so it's, it's useful in uh, trauma cases where you're losing blood or blood pressure. Um, a patient with a sick heart um, or a patient with uh, sick lungs. Um, we already talked about propofol and um, local anesthetics or numbing medication. Um, the three um, primary local anesthetics we use are lidocaine, marcaine, and ropivacaine. Um, marcaine and ropivacaine are sort of medium duration, so maybe uh, two hours to like 12 to 16 hours in a nerve block. Um, Marcaine is cardiotoxic, so we definitely don't want to inject marcaine into a vein. Um, Rapivacaine is far less cardiotoxic, so we would use that on frail patients or sick, or sick patients. Um, so just some thoughts about uh, hemodynamics. Uh, we as CRNAs are required to maintain normal hemodynamics for a patient. So that means maintaining their oxygenation, uh, their breathing off of CO2, which we talked about already. Um, maintaining a normal heart rate, heart rhythm, normal blood pressure, uh, temperature, uh, relieving pain with pain meds, uh, giving medications at the end to hopefully uh, prevent nausea and vomiting, um, and many other IV medications. Um, so some things that can go wrong with anesthesia, uh, complications, um, an upper, upper airway obstruction, um, so a patient is breathing on their own, um, but when they go to sleep, when they fall asleep, all their uh, tissue in their airway uh, relaxes and it can cause an upper airway obstruction. That causes their oxygen level to drop. Um, if, it, if that happens too long, you can have brain damage or you can go into cardiac arrest. Uh, laryngospasm, uh, this is uh, contracting of uh, muscles in your larynx. Um, so why does laryngospasm happen? Um, it's, it's a response of the brain to um, something foreign in the neck or in the throat. Um, so the brain tells the muscles in the neck to spasm or contract. That closes the airway. Would you give them some sort of other medication to kind of like... Yeah. We'd give them like... tell the brain... Like yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Put their brain to sleep again. Uh, we can give them like a little bit of sucks to paralyze um, these muscles. <laughs> Need some socks. <laughs> <laughs> um, a corneal abrasion. So we accidentally scratched the eyeball. We're supposed to tape their eyes after we put them to sleep all the way because uh, you don't know your eyes are open because you're unconscious. And so your eyeballs can be all the way open. And if we brushed up against your eye, we can scratch your eye and 
uh, cause a lot of eye pain afterwards, potential blindness. Um, we can cause bleeding in the larynx or throat or trachea from using too much force uh, intubating or placing one of those uh, double lumen tubes. Um, we could accidentally place the breathing tube in the esophagus, which doesn't do anything because you're not providing oxygen through the trachea to the lungs. Um, so you would cause a buildup of acid, lack, lack of oxygen, cardiac arrest, uh, death, or brain injury. Um, if that's going to happen, it happens a lot in the field with uh, paramedics, but um, they use video, they use video laryngoscopes, uh, my understanding, just like we do, to help reduce that. Um, we could accidentally place the breathing tube in the right lobe of the lung only and not um, breathe both lungs. Um, we already talked about aspiration. Um, risk of that would be if a patient lies to us and doesn't tell us when they actually had something to eat or drink uh, when they actually did. Um, or if they have some type of disease where their function of their GI tract is extremely slowed, they can aspirate. Um, we talked about accidentally putting the central line in an artery. Um, what can go wrong with a nerve block? accidentally piercing the nerve with a needle or injecting numbing medication into the nerve. This would cause prolonged paralysis and or numbness um, and potentially, you know, risk a lawsuit. But my understanding is most of the time this uh, numbness that can be caused by the block will usually return in like three to four months, which seems like a long time. Um, but most of the time it does return. Um, how does this happen? Um, you know, moving too quick with your nerve block, um, not doing something you're doing something you're not comfortable doing. Um, we primarily want to place nerve blocks in uh, awake but sedated patients so they can tell us if they're having pain within a nerve block. Um, using the nerve stimulator we already talked about. Um, hey Matthew, just, I'm not trying to cut you off, but yep. do we have time just to ask some questions from them? Only because I know some of them have to go to work at 12.30. Sure. Um, questions, Natasha, do you mind if we just go down the line and Natasha has a question? Um, anesthetic gas, it has an expiration date, correct? Mm -hmm. How long does it last? Like, how long is it good like on shelf? On a shelf? I have no idea. <laughs> um, whatever the expiration date is. Um, I mean, I, I can look it up. But like, is it like, like in a in an actual like, bottle? Yeah, like would it be like years or would it be kind of like you have to like use it? Like, like it's it's, it it's stored in a glass bottle with like a dark tint to it. So my guess is, you know, if we continue to open it and refill our vaporizer, um, that's where the anesthetic gas is stored and delivered through our anesthesia machine. I mean, I would say shelf life, maybe a couple of months. But if you don't open it, you know, maybe six months. But I'm just guessing. I really don't know. Does Good question. Does the company come in and do that for you? Don't they, like, assess the expiration dates and, that and make sure everything's within standard? Yes. Um, we're supposed to check our expiration dates on, like, all of our medications, like, you know, once a month or so, just to make sure we're in compliance. Um, and throw away anything that's old. Or if it's about to expire, we'll use that versus like another vial. I have a question. Okay. Yep. Is uh, anesthesia awareness, is that a real thing where you, you're under anesthesia but you kind of still sense what's going on? Yeah. Has you that ever ha happened to you? And how do you know that's actually happening? Um, it hasn't happened to me. Um, you know, just like any of these complications, these things can happen when people cut corners, um, when they're not paying attention when they're you know talking to somebody and not focusing on their monitors or their patient um, most of the time if it's going to happen it's going to happen like in a trauma or an emergency setting where you can't use that much anesthesia because it'll drop the blood pressure when you know blood loss is already causing the blood pressure to drop um, so i'd say in a trauma or like a massive blood loss situation where we need to put them to sleep so they can have surgery to fix it, that's when they're going to have some awareness. But usually we'll give some Versed, like I talked about on top of it. it yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's stories where patients, you know, woke up, you know, they were paralyzed. And uh, I, the whole thing. I, yeah. saw, I just recently saw one. This guy had like a open heart surgery mm -hmm. and he remembers the entire thing. God, it's traumatic. <laughs> Good one. So is that, they just completely didn't give them the anesthesia. They just, it was just like the, um, 
the stuff that makes you paralyzed, you can't move. Yeah, or they they didn't give an extra dose of uh, you know Versed, which is like it's we call it like I don't care, I don't remember medicine. They may have given some upfront, but maybe they forgot that most of the time it only lasts like an hour and a half, and you might need to redose it. Um, sometimes they'll use a monitor called a biz monitor, which it takes um, electric impulses from the brain and has like a mathematical equation and it generates a number. It's a biz number. So if we know the biz number um, for an unconscious patient is 45, if on our monitor that number starts as 45 and is creeping up to like 60, 70, 80, then you need to redose your sleepy medication um, or give some more, um, I don't care, I don't remember medicine. So I thought that was, wouldn't his heart be like beating so fast? Yeah, oh yeah. Paralyzed, but he couldn't speak. Yeah, he couldn't move. He couldn't do anything. He just felt it. Yeah. But that's what he might. Thinking, like he can think, so he must have, like his heart must have been racing so fast. Yeah. And, and he, he missed it. Yeah, and maybe they they gave him medication to slow his heart rate down, oh, and, yeah, and, and by itself, and that was it. Crazy. So yeah. Usually, uh, I'll guess um, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen when they're on the um, bypass machine, when they're actually doing the surgery, because uh, the bypass machine is just, you know, giving uh, oxygen in their blood and uh, perfusing all their organs. The bypass machine isn't actually giving them anesthesia. So a lot of times before we go on bypass, we'll give them an extra slug of something that we know is going to last maybe an hour, hour and a half, just for extra assurance. He could like recall their conversations that they were having and everything. Just open your checkbook. <laughs> yeah, just write your check. Write your check. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions before uh, Matt? How long is schooling for CRA? Um, now it's uh, three years and it's a doctorate, so you'd have to have a um, bachelor's in nursing and then like two, to, two, uh, two years ICU as an ICU nurse and then uh, three years of actual anesthesia, which seems like a long time, but it used to be a master's program, which was two and a half years. Now they went to three, so now it's an extra six months. That might deter some people, um, but it's still an awesome career and you know, I, I would do it all over again if they tacked you know, six months onto it, it's 100% worth it. So what is it, um, like the difference between you and like an actual anesthesiologist, like what do they have? They have four years of medicine, um, then they have um, three years of actually like, two to three years of specialty um, uh, education. Uh, this is kind of getting to the politics of um, CRNAs versus anesthesiologists. But a lot of times anesthesiologists will discount our training hours to say like they have 12,000 to 16,000 hours and we have like 2,400. Well, the thing they're not telling you is that they're leaving out our two to three years worth of ICU training, which still counts as we're, we're nurses, but we're still being trained um, in areas of medicine and critical care that ultimately translate into doing a job, a better job as, as CRNAs. Um, so ultimately we, we do the same job. Um, they have a medical education. We have a nursing background, but somewhat of a medical education when we're doing our ICU experience because you're still involved with medicine and um, medical conditions. Um, anesthesia is both the practice of nursing and medicine. Um, getting into politics. You know, some anesthesiologists would say no, it's the practice of medicine, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we do the same job, we work together. Um, as far as differences in the two, um, that's sort of a political discussion. So um, anesthesiologists, not all, but many want to stifle our profession because of the way medicine is going and health insurance is going, everything's getting more cost uh, efficient and insurance companies and Medicare, Medicaid are trying to trim as much cost as they can. Um, 
So we are more cost effective than anesthesiologists are. So that's sort of a threat. So they'll do things to uh, maintain or advance their turf, such as create the perception that we're not adequately trained or that we can't do what they can do or that we have to be supervised 100%. Um, those are usually falsehoods. You know, just like politics, it depends on, you know, you have to look at it through a broad scope or a broad field of vision and examine both sides. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, we work together uh, to take care of patients and uh, help each other. Um, so there's some politics involved, some places, but most places we work together and uh, we do a great job working hand in hand. Um, but yeah, as an anesthesiologist, you can go to med school, you can specialize in anesthesia. Um, as far as legislation is concerned, um, anesthesiologists have spent a lot more money than CRNAs to uh, lobby and create favorable legislation. So they don't have as many roadblocks as uh, CRNAs do to, for example, practicing independently. Um, there's some roadblocks to that for CRNAs in certain states. Um, but many states we can practice independently without supervision. Uh, I think right now we're at 20 states we can practice without supervision. Um, and actually there's pockets of all 50 states where we can practice without supervision. You can, it just depends on the hospital, um, the hospital policy. Can a private physician call you in as a consultant and you can set up anesthesia? Yes. 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 So you work at Bayfront? Uh, Bayfront, Murdoch Surgery Center. Uh, I'm going to start working at Bayfront, Punta Gorda, and also uh, Cape Coral Surgery Center. So does your schedule work like differently? Do you work at all those different? Yeah. Um, it kind of varies, but it's nice for me because my wife and I have um, a two and three year old. Mm -hmm. So I'm you know, just trying to do this currently to maximize time with them while they're young and still think I'm cool. Uh, <laughs> one day they won't and they'll want to have their own lives and then we might work a little bit harder and you know take call and things like that but for now we try to maximize our time at home yeah yeah exactly how long have you been doing this um eight years seven and a half years i've got some gray hair so i've been doing it a little bit I was an ICU nurse for three years before. Three years. Yeah. And that's just what you did was ICU. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm probably like everyone, you know, I played when I should have been focused on studying and making all A's. You know, I was more worried about my girlfriend and what she wanted than uh, making all A's. And so, you know, had some A's and B's and a couple C's. But then, you know, I, I tightened up and realized um, this is what I wanted to do. So I went back and took some courses and got A's. And, um, you know, most people I would say have like two to three years of ICU experience, which is actually very fulfilling. I mean, you take care of patients and you develop, you know, great bonds with your coworkers and your patients. It's not like you're doing like prison time while you're waiting, you know, for your chance to um, apply and be admitted. You're having a lot of fun too as an ICU nurse. Um, Wolford and Naples, which okay. it's now been absorbed by Kaiser. So I think it's just strictly Kaiser now. Um, yeah. So I actually moved from Alabama, um, shot my 30th birthday to um, start my training in Naples and met my wife in the same program. She trapped me. So now we have, yeah, yeah. So now we have happy family and I've been here for, been here for 10 years. I mean, it literally just flies. So that was going to be my last talking point is, um, you know, time is going to pass no matter what you do. So if there's any kind of voice inside of your head that, you know, wants to keep advancing your career, um, you know, what you're doing now is awesome. But if you want to keep going and be an instructor, um, time is going to pass no matter what you do. So if there's, you know, anything you want to do, don't wait because it, it, it literally just flies by. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me.